This is Algebra 2, Lesson 86, on page 355. All right, the first part of this lesson is greater than. So, all of um, these expressions are going to be inequalities. And we're going to start with greater thans. And they're all going to be graphed on a line. So really, for any set of numbers, there are three options. And I'm just going to make this up. Here's our three options. Do you remember the three possibilities from geometry? Maybe. Um, so in geometry, what is called a postulate and algebra is called an axiom. So remember postulates, we didn't have to prove. They're truths that are assumed to be true without proving. The same way with axioms in algebra. An axiom is, um, doesn't require any proof. It is something that is true uh, and not requiring proof. Um, so this is, a, this is actually, they call it the trichotomy in algebra, but in geometry we call it the three possibilities. So either a set of values equals a number, that's the first possibility, or it's greater than a number, or it's less than some value. That's the three possibilities. If it is equal to a value, um, then we know that X has to equal two. You agree? So if I'm on a number line, then I'm marking that number line just like that. If it is greater than, we're going to use algebra, that's what this lesson is about, greater than. We are going to use algebra to solve for the value of X, and it's going to be a range of numbers. So by subtracting four on each side, we have X is greater than two. So if X is greater than two, can it equal two? It cannot. This is a closed indicator. When you have a closed indicator, it means it can equal the number. When it can't equal the number, you use an open indicator. And so two is not darkened at all. And we would graph it that way. There's another way <clears throat> that we can, can um, notate this. And it's called, we can use a number line or we can use what's <coughs> called interval notation. <clears throat> which is used in lots of high schools. This is not in your textbook. Interval notation is not in your textbook, so you should write it down. With interval notation, you use this kind of a bracket when it can equal the number. That is called a closed interval, closed interval. Much like this is a closed interval. You use a parentheses when it can't equal, when it's either <clears throat> greater than or less than, but not equal. And so this is called an open interval. That is an open <coughs> interval. Much like this is an open interval interval. Next year, we will probably solely use interval notation and not graph on a number line. So I'm going to do both in this lesson. We're going to graph it on a number line and we're going to use interval notation. All right, so 
let's just finish looking at this one. We're, we're not going to do less than. Less than is not in this lesson. <clears throat> so really, this, this equation, or inequality, it's not an equation, it's an inequality, really goes from any number greater than 2 all the way to positive infinity. Right? Because it, it keeps going without end. So it goes all the way to positive infinity. We begin with an open notation. Can infinity ever be reached? Never. So we always use an open interval with infinity because infinity is not a value that can be reached. So if I were going to write this in interval notation, x greater than 2, it cannot equal 2, and it would go all the way to infinity. And you always use the curvy bracket with infinity. <clears throat> all right, let's, let's go back and look. What if it were x less than 2? Then on a number line, <clears throat> we would begin at two. It cannot equal it, so we would begin with an open interval. And then we would draw our line to the left. Because <clears throat> there's a couple of things I want us to see. You're always drawing your line <clears throat> in the direction of the inequality. You see that? So if you wrote this and drew this, it doesn't match. Make sense? All right, we know what this looks like in interval notation, but what would this look like? What is the very lowest number that this can be? Negative infinity. So we begin with negative infinity, and it can go all the way up to 2, but not equal 2. All right, let's change this just a little bit. What if I added that? Then it can also equal 2. It's 2 and every number greater than 2. So then we begin with a closed interval, and we draw our line. And this curvy bracket changes to that. Make sense? Why not both sides? I'm glad you asked that. Because this one says it can equal two. Can it ever equal infinity? It reaches infinity. Infinity is a concept, not a digit. Does that make sense? So it can never reach infinity. So always with infinity, you use the curvy bracket. If it can equal it, you're using the box one. Got it? All right, let's work. Well, let me say one more thing, a couple more things. All right. So sometimes your problems are going to be written they're negating the sign. When they negate the sign, that means not less than. So if it's not less than, then what is it? It is greater than or equal to. It is both of the other. That's why you need to know the three possibilities. If we have, then it is not equal to, it is not greater than, so it must be less than. So oftentimes your signs are negated. You just have to switch, change the signs. <clears throat> All right. Let's look at example one. I, I really want to say one more thing. <laughs> but I feel like I've said a lot. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at example one. It says graph x less than 3. Okay, I'm going to have to say it. That's easy.
All right, look at this first example. What does this D mean? It means domain. Domain always is your all your possible X values. This means is an element of, it's the same thing as equal, but this is the more appropriate symbol to use in math. It's an element of. Now this says only positive integers. Okay, how do we graph integers? So what is this saying? The only possible X values that satisfy this equation are pos positive integers. So what are the positive integers that satisfy X less than three? Just two and one. So it would be graphed like this. My preference, if I were writing a textbook, was not just to graph integers, but all reals. That's reals. Um, such that it would look like this. So probably on my test that I give you, you will be graphing all reals, not just integers. But it is important for you to understand what this word integer means. An integer is just every whole number, positives and negatives. Okay, why did we not include zero here? Because zero is actually an integer. It's zero is neither positive or negative. So it doesn't qualify as a positive integer. All right? So I prefer, much prefer example two. All right, so let's go back here. What well, we can't do. You don't use interval notation when you're just doing integers because you can't just notate uh, integers in interval notation. You only notate all reals in interval notation. So we're gonna do example two, and we're gonna notate, we're gonna um, also graph it and use interval notation. X less than three, what does that D stand for? Domain. domain. What is domain? X, X, X. Domain goes with X. Domain goes with X. X values. Wait, that's a negative three, isn't it? And actually it's uh, greater than negative three. Greater than negative three. All right, so what, how, how am I going to graph this? I know my line is gonna go from left to right. What do I put at negative three? Open interval. And I draw my line in this direction. All right, so I know we go from negative three all the way to positive infinity. Now, what does my interval notation look like? What's, what's to the left of the negative three? Curve and infinity. Always curve, that's right. So that's what it would look like in interval notation. <laughs> All right, we're going on to example. Yes? So when we're doing, when we have like the x greater than negative three or whatever, the x is always in the front, correct? It's always the first variable rather than the three. It's always on the left side of the variable. Okay. Side. That's the way I prefer to write it. That's not, I, I could have written, you know, in the problems before, and subtracted four. Yeah, but would it, but would the arrows still work? The arrows Just don't work. Exactly. Okay, so rotate it around. The pointy part goes to the X. Got it? And, and so rewrite it this way. Okay, you guys should 
know this well enough to say x less than 2. Can you read them backwards? X less than 2 because the point is at the x. That's always less than. That's, think of the alligator, right? The alligator's mouth wants the biggest. The open alligator's mouth wants the biggest piece. The smallest piece is right at that vertex of the arrow. So it's x less than two, same, x less than two. I always turn it around, I always do. Mentally, I need to see that. All right, let's look at example three. Now we're gonna negate it. X, not this, and we're going to graph them all reals. In your homework, you may graph them all as reals, all of them. That means your solution won't match the answer key, but you can graph them all as reals. I don't know of another textbook that does just integers. So we're gonna do all reals. So what's, what, what is possible? If these two are not possible, Therese, what is possible? Yes. So, what do I have at negative four? <coughs> Open interval, and which direction do we go? All right, so what does my interval notation look like? <coughs> Got it? You sort of get an interval notation a little bit. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna change this next one up a little bit. Nope, this one is good. That, this means reals. All reals. <clears throat> that's everything that's not complex, that's not an I. Every number that's not I. So it's irrationals, like square root of three. Everything can be located on a number line. All right, so if it can't be this, then what must it be? Less than or equal to, right? All right, let's subtract the four from both sides. We have negative x less than or equal to negative two. All right. What do I do now? Yes, Therese. Did you multiply this by the negative four? Yes. And what happens when I multiply or divide by a negative one? You switch the direction of the sign. Greater than, equal to two. When you divide by or multiply by a negative, you switch the direction of the sign, but don't lose your equality. Got it? All right, that is oftentimes on the ACT. All right, so what is it? X, what is this sign? Greater than or equal to two. So what is that two? Closed. closed interval, and I'm drawing my line to the right. So what does the interval notation look like? Bracket. Bracket. Two, comma, infinity, infinity parentheses. parentheses. Got it? It looks kind of funny. I think it looks kind of funny, but that is proper interval notation. All right, one more example. Negative x minus 4, not that. And again, we're going to do all reals. I'm not going to do just negative integers. You do need to understand what, the, what an integer is because that is on the ACT. And I have tutored students that can't answer an ACT question because they don't know what an integer is. What is an integer? 
All the whole numbers. All the whole numbers. Ne all the negatives, zero, all the positive numbers. That's what an integer is. Whole numbers, positive and negative. All right, so if it's not this, then what is it? The other one, yes. <laughs> all right, it's less than. So we're going to add the four on both sides. And we have negative x less than 2. What do I do now? Multiply every term by negative 1. And, or really just change the sign of every term and flip the sign. So x greater than negative 2. Make sense here? All right, so what, what happens at negative 2? Open interval, and I draw my line to the right. All right, what interval notation is at negative 2? Parentheses. It goes all the way to infinity with a parentheses. All right. Now, the second part of this lesson is exactly what I told on Monday. We have a circle and we have a line and we're going to solve for the two solutions, but now we're going to have a, an irrational solution. So we're going to have radical as our solution. All right, so let's work. I believe there's only one example. It's example six on 357. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 9. And then we have y minus x equals 1. All right, so what's the first thing I do? What am I going to do? Y'all help me. Add x to both sides. I want to take my linear equation and solve for one of the variables. So I'm going to add x to both sides. So y equals x plus 1. Then what am I going to do? Substitute this in to my second degree equation where y is. So we have x squared plus x plus 1 goes where y is, and it is squared equals 9. Now we're squaring this term. It's x plus 1 times x plus 1. So write it out if you need to. All right, so y'all help me foil this. First term, I put equal. <laughs> yes. Yes. Outers and inners. Plus 1. Let's go ahead and subtract 9 equals 0. Right, I move the 9 to the left through subtraction. All right, let's combine our like <clears throat> terms. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> what do you do next? Okay, what's the formula? Negative B plus or minus. That's right. We can do that. It's a really big one. Or, or, or <laughs> we could take out a 2 and then we still have to do completing the square, but our numbers are smaller. All right, what did I do? I just factored a 2 out. So we have to make this zero because it has to be two times whatever is zero. Okay, you can use this for A, this for B, this for C. Or you can use one, one, and negative four for A, B, and C. Got it? Either way, you're going to get the same answer. Here, you're going to have to simplify. Here, you're not going to have to simplify. All right, so X equals the opposite of B plus minus the square root of, help me. B squared plus 4 is All right, so x equals negative 1. Yeah. Square root of. This is 16. It's positive because there's two negatives. So 1 plus 16 is? 
That's it. It's negative one half plus and minus the square root of 17 over two. All right, so I have my two X values. One is plus, one is minus. So we'll go ahead and write our X values in. One is negative one half plus square root of 17 over two. The other one is negative one half minus square root of 17 over two. Now we have to solve for y. Always go back to your linear equation. All right, so I'm gonna erase below it. So the value of y equals the value of x. I'm gonna plug this one in. Negative one half plus square root of 17 over two plus one. We're gonna add our rationals and leave our irrationals alone. So what's negative one plus one? What's a, a negative half plus one whole? One half. So y equals one half plus square root of 17 over two. One half plus square root of 17 over two. I'm only combining the one and the negative one half. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave square root of 17 over two alone. Remember, we're not writing this as a decimal. All right, now let's go in and plug in this X. So now we have Y equals negative one half minus square root of 17 over two plus one. Again, what's one whole minus one half? So Y equals one half minus square root of 17 over two. One half minus square root of 17 over two. Yes, I could start out x equals. <coughs> so I would first get my y values, but I still am going to use the quadratic formula, but instead of x equals, I'm going to make it y equals. And I could be solving for this one first and then plug y back in and solve for x. So yes, both ways. <coughs> 